In this video, I'm sharing the details of my Shapeoko setup and customizations. Everything from spindle to stream deck, so stick around for the details. That's what I'm talking about. Over the last year, I've really put my machines to work, making all sorts of mixed media projects. And through the process, I've encountered just about every glitch and shortcoming with my machines. Since they're not industrial tools, there are lots of opportunities to improve the performance, and that's what this video is about. Lots of small improvements for the Shapeoko that will take your machine to the next level. If you're not pushing your machine to the limits, then this video probably isn't for you, as this investment can almost double the cost of your machine. If you are, then these upgrades can improve the reliability and performance you get from using it, so let's get started. This video is going to cover a lot, so here's the agenda and where to jump for the specific topics. The Shapeoko 3 upgrades in this video include 1. Eccentric nuts to improve the accuracy and tuning of your gantry. 2. V-wheels to reduce radial and axial runout in the gantry. 3. Limit switches to increase accuracy and reliability of your positioning. 4. Replacing the Z-axis to improve plunging strength and spindle rigidity. 5. Upgrading to a 2.2 kilowatt spindle to increase torque speed and reduce the noise. 6. An aluminum table adding structural rigidity and reducing table warpage. 7. An air and coolant mister for improved cutting performance in hard materials. 8. A drain pan to keep your enclosure clean, collecting excess coolant and debris. 9. A stream deck to control your CNC on the fly with style. And 10. Finally adding an emergency shutoff switch. With that, first up is upgrading the eccentric nuts which is probably the least significant upgrade I made. These are the offset nuts that allow you to adjust the V-wheel engagement on the aluminum extrusions. If they're not tight enough, then you have slop in the frame. If they're too tight, you can wear out your wheels or cause unnecessary drag in your gantry. These are all bad things. At the end of the day, the heavy-duty eccentric nut upgrade has an extended collar that fully seats in the steel end plates, along with a larger head giving you more confidence in the bolt load path when making adjustments. To install these in the existing holes, the coating on the steel plates needed to be reamed out a bit for a tight fit. While tuning your machine on a regular basis is necessary to maintain performance, heavy-duty eccentric nuts can make the process a little bit more reliable. With the eccentric nuts replaced, it makes sense to upgrade the V-wheels, but why? Well, the V-wheels determine how well they're tuned, and they're hardness determine how rigid your machine is. If you have slop or soft V-wheels coated with dust and debris from your machine, then it's likely it won't be as, as accurate. You may experience jerky movement and poor dimensional accuracy, and even worse, inconsistent repeatability, which can be a nightmare when milling tight tolerance parts. The wheels I used are a direct replacement to the existing wheels, but they're slightly beefier with a sealed bearing and precision shim. You may need to file your belt tension brackets to prevent interference with the new wheels, but this is a quick fix with a file. To be fair, the stock wheels are fine for most people, but if you want to squeeze more more performance from your machine, a higher durometer wheel helps out. Just be sure to keep those rails clear of debris. If you find yourself having to clean them a lot, then check out my V-wheel dust covers from my previous video and save yourself some time. The V-wheel upgrade will take around an hour, loosen the eccentric nuts and replace one wheel at a time, starting with the top and then moving to the bottom. Once they're all replaced, adjust your eccentric nuts moving the wheels in until there's no axial or radial wiggle. That's the technical term. A good test when you think you have it right is to try to spin the wheel while holding the axis. If the wheel is able to spin without moving the axis, then adjust the wheel a little bit more. When you're done, you should have a solid gantry movement in all axis, no wiggle or slop. Next up, limit switches. Now, mechanical limit switches are fine and under most circumstances, but they are susceptible to interference from debris and other foreign matter that can build up on your machine. Replacing your mechanical limit switches with powered proximity switches can eliminate the potential for any interference. These proximity switches are powered from your control board and they actively detect the presence of metal by leveraging an oscillator and magnetic field on the sensor. In short, these sensors are highly accurate and detect your end rails without touching them mechanically. They're easy to swap out and wire up, but you may need to modify your limit switch brackets to position them correctly for your machine. So far, we've made a couple minor upgrades that improve the integrity of the X and Y rails. Next, I swapped out the Z axis with a ball screw drive also known as the HDZ from Beaver CNC. Although there are a few different Z axis available, the HDZ is solid and compact and you'll gain some extra X travel in this upgrade alone. If you've ever milled any hard material with the stock Shapeoko Z gantry, you may have experienced inconsistent Z travel when trying to plunge. The HDZ will eliminate that issue while also being able to hold much heavier spindles without being limited to a spring tensioner. The upgrade was a direct swap out and uses parts from the stock gantry to mount and drive the HDZ. With the Z gantry prepared for business, 
this, it was time to replace the router with a real spindle. I chose to go the easy route and grab an Amazon 2.2 kilowatt spindle and VFD set. Going into this, I was a little bit naive and went with a 110 volt spindle, thinking I'd be able to use an existing outlet uh, already in my shop. After reading the finer details, I had to upgrade the outlet to a 20 amp circuit. For the VFD to function at peak performance for the spindle, less voltage was going to require more amperage. In retrospect, I could have gone with a 220 kit, which would run at a higher voltage and lower amperage. So far, I haven't experienced any limitation with the 110 volt spindle, but either way, I had to run a new circuit, so choose wisely. That said, wiring the dedicated outlet and circuit was just the beginning. If you get a new spindle kit from Amazon, chances are it'll come with a fountain pump for the water-cooled spindle. And if you're like me, that's just not good enough for several reasons. A, the flow rate's inconsistent. B, it's not a closed-loop cooling system, so dust and matter can get into the water channel and cause problems for your spindle. C, I really didn't have room for a five-gallon bucket of water to sit next to the machine, so I chose another route. In designing a closed-loop solution, I researched the closed-loop cooling system used for PCs. And while most of the pumps were low-end and low-pressure, the right parts were available for price. Ultimately, I decided on a dual-fan radiator, a small reservoir to bleed the lines, a swift tech pump, and a digital flow and temperature meter. All of this would be connected with 8.6 clear tubing that would be compatible with the spindle. My closed loop cooling system was designed in a very specific order. The pump output went directly to the spindle. The spindle return went to the flow and temperature meter. This will tell me the temperature and flow coming out of the spindle. From there it goes into the radiator where it's cooled with thermally controlled fans and then from the radiator the line goes into the reservoir where air can be removed from the line. And finally from the reservoir it goes back into the pump supply with clean cool fluid. I chose to use Coolant's cooling fluid for its anti-corrosion and antibacteria properties. This setup should last for a couple years before needing to be replaced. Since I had several components that were basically designed for computer cooling, they needed 12 volt for the pump and fans and 5 volt for the flow and temperature meter. I grabbed a generic 30 amp 12 volt power supply to keep them happy. Well, almost. I used a step down converter from 12 to 5 volts to feed the flow meter 5 volts. And since the fans were PWM, I bought a simple PWM fan controller board with a thermal couple that would regulate the fan speed based on the temperature of the radiator. With the circuit and cooling loop ready, I 3D printed a few brackets and hold downs and then wired all the components up into a reasonably organized setup. This was all then mounted to the side of the enclosure. Next, wiring the spindle to the VFD, I used a 144 double insulated wire which I then ran through a nylon braid to finish it off. This would more than handle the 20 amps spread across the three phase wires and using the fourth wire as a ground. The wires were soldered into the spindle connector and connected to the VFD. A PWM and ground wire were ran from the carbide control board to the VFD. This would control the spindle speed with M3 commands. I had to change a few minor firmware defaults in Gerbil, and then that part was complete. And finally, after reading through the VFD user manual, I had to make a few adjustments to ensure that it was properly configured for the voltage and amperage of the spindle. All of those settings are available in the description below. Running a few tests, things look great. All right, the hard parts were done. Next, I upgraded the work table with a threaded aluminum bed from Ohio's Diesel Parts. These things are solid 12 meter aluminum and use all the stock mounting holes. Structurally, they added around 50 pounds to the machine. The weight reduced resonance, and being aluminum, they'll be great for running coolant on the machine. These things are definitely not cheap, but they are final. Plus, they'll force me to validate my tool pass twice before running anything on this thing, and that's always good. Next, I add an air and coolant mister. These things are fairly inexpensive and come in several variations. I use the spare mount holes on the side of the HDZ to create a 3mm aluminum mount plate. I also use that mount plate for my x-axis proximity limit switch. To complete the setup, I sourced a 48-ounce sports water bottle and an aluminum bracket. I mounted it to the rear of the enclosure and ran a 3mm line to the mister. Rather than run air from the compressor, I landed a 1,000 liter per minute aquarium pump and ran it through an 8.6 poly air line uh, to the mister. Now I have the adjustments for the fluid and air at the spindle. For fluid, I'm using trim cutting and grinding synthetic misting fluid reduced to 5% per gallon of distilled water. It's very mild and seems to work well with aluminum. With all of the coolant, electrical, air, and cooling lines ran, I 3D printed some wire loom snap clips to hold them all together. To help keep the lines out of the way, I used a retractable spring clips to assist with the line weight. With the table and mister complete, I added a drip pan under my machine to ensure the coolant and debris that gets under the machine is captured by the tray before damaging my enclosure. Not a bad setup, right? Next was the fun part, adding a stream deck as a dynamic control board for the machine. Now I've used stream deck for a few months for real-time hotkeys and streaming functionality, so I was familiar with the capabilities of the device. Being able to create visually intuitive menu systems is where it really shines. Of course you could use a Bluetooth keypad 
keypad for the same thing and it'll save you a few bucks, but the flexibility to change and customize the Stream Deck's appearance on the fly is great. With the new spindle and setup, I chose to use Universal G-Code Center to get the most from the Z-axis and the system. As a result, UGS has a ton of hotkeys that control just about any aspect of the G-Code that's being sent as well as the machine configuration. First, I identified the hierarchy of operations that I wanted to include on the Stream Deck. I needed to init and home the machine, perform basic gantry movements, adjust the X, Y, and Z steps, of course zero each axis, complex rapids to specific locations on the machine, and run a job with spindle and feed overrides. Having a list of needs, I performed several layouts then designed icons to work with all the hotkeys. Using the Stream Deck configuration tool, I set up the nested layout in a manner that made sense to me. The main screen allows movements and zeroing. The init screen allows to connect, home, reset, and unlock the machine. The nav screen allows you to navigate to specific locations by running all the custom macros I created. The step screen provides default settings for step of my X, Y, and Z ranging from 10 millimeter all the way to 1000. Finally, a run screen allows you to run your job and override feeds and spindle speeds in real time. This is probably my favorite upgrade and really helps with setting up and running the machine. The last thing I did was to add an emergency shutoff switch. This isn't a hardwired switch, but rather an Arduino powered switch that sends a stop hotkey. It's connected to USB and acts as a human interface device. It was an easy add that simplifies the stop command when I don't have time to think about finding it on the stream deck. So that's it, a few upgrades that'll make a world of difference in how I use and benefit from the Shape Poco in the upcoming projects. For now, it's time to get back to fun stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video or found it useful. Many of the details and links to products and configuration info can be found in the description below. If you want to use the same parts I use, please use my channel affiliate links. It costs the same and supports the channel, and that helps me bring better content. So that's it for now. Leave comments below if you want, and share this video with other Shape Poco users. Be safe, have fun, and I'll see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building in the community. Also, allow me to bring better content. Also, check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there, too.